Good morning. Um, I'm Ken Rosen from the University of Alabama School of Law. Um, it's terrific to see so many former students and friends and great lawyers um, here in the room today. Um, I am here to welcome our official welcomer. Uh, but before that, let me briefly offer a couple of thank yous. So first, let me thank Lisa Izell, who's down here in the front, and the rest of the FedSoc team who are here and who have helped make this conference and the strength of the Alabama chapters so great. Um, and you know, so much of a presence of the society in our state. Um, you know, we have a bunch of people here who I hope you all will get to meet, like Peter Redpath, who works with our student chapters, and of course, Lisa on the lawyer chapter um, side. You know, trust me, Lisa is bombarded constantly by people like me, Chief Judge Bill Pryor, uh, Justice Jay Mitchell, with ideas about what to do um, in Alabama with FedSoc. Um, and she really has made these ideas a reality. Um, so we have our new chapter up in Huntsville, and obviously we are now for the second time getting together for our all-state conference. Um, you know, I said after last year's event that I think it was really one of the greatest gatherings of conservative and libertarian lawyers in the state in its history, and obviously today I think we're going to match that. Our speakers include, amongst others, distinguished academics and practitioners, um, current and former solicitor generals from four states, state Supreme Court justices from three states, federal and district judges from four circuits, and of course, joining us later electronically is going to be Justice Clarence Thomas of the US Supreme Court. Uh, we're particularly blessed and thankful to have Justice Thomas participating at our conference. We all know the brilliance of his jurisprudence, um, but equally significant is the generosity of his spirit. Um, he's been particularly kind to our law school. Um, as some of you know, one of our graduates, Caroline Stevens Milner, will be clerking for him this term. But even on much you know, lesser known um, level, He's come, he's met with our chapter, he has signed books for every student, taken pictures with every one of them, and I think that generosity of spirit really inspires them to become great lawyers. Um, someone else who similarly inspires law, our young lawyers is our official welcomer, Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall. Um, you know, he comes from an unbelievable tradition in the Office of Attorney General in our state where so many great lawyers have been attorney generals or have been on the staff there. Um, you know, he equally measures up to that list of former holders of the office. He is a prosecutor's prosecutor. Um, after getting his undergrad degree from the University of North Carolina, as well as his law degree from the University of Alabama, um, in working in private practice, he served for 16 years as Marshall County's um, GA before becoming our AG in 2017. Um, as AG, he's an, you know, assembled an incredible team, some of whom you will hear from today, um, it's hard to think of any who match his devotion to the state and his selfless work on behalf of his people. Um, but beyond those cases that are often in the news, General Marshall also is an incredible mentor to young attorneys in our state. Um, I frequently hear stories of you know, these young attorneys who tell me about how he gives out his email address, how he wants to talk to them about being lawyers. Beyond his court victories, really preparing a new generation of lawyers will be his great legacy for our state. Um, so I'm privileged to give you the Marshall. Ken was very gracious with his introduction. Obviously, he didn't talk to Hillary Clinton this week based on her response to me. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to have so many of Alabama's conservative legal champions 
here in one room. And I got to admit to you, a little pleasantly surprised some of my big law friends here publicly affiliating with the conservative legal movement. Uh, I promise I won't tell your managing partners if that's OK. Um, I want to start a little bit this morning with you sharing a story that I once heard Ronald Reagan tell. And it was about a location in DC that was hosting a Democratic rally. And when the rally was over, people were coming out, and there was a young boy outside yelling, Democratic puppies for sale, Democratic puppies. Two weeks later, at that same location, there was a Republican fundraiser. And as the people were leaving, that same boy was there. And he was saying, Republican puppies for sale, Republican puppies for sale. And there was a reporter that had been there just a couple weeks earlier and saw that same boy there. And he walked over and he said, hey, look, two weeks ago, you were here selling these as Democratic puppies. Today, you're here trying to sell them as Republicans. What's up? The boy looked at him and said, well, today their eyes are open. <laughs> now. FedSoc is a nonpartisan organization. I don't tell that story to take a slam at my Democratic colleagues, but Reagan's punchline really reflects what I appreciate about this organization because I will tell you that it is by participation in events like this, lunchtime seminars, going to DC for the National Convention, that I truly find my eyes open to the issues that I deal with daily, to the debates that we have about in this country relating to our Constitution. And it's why events like this, I think, are so important to help us grow in our practice of law, but most importantly, our appreciation of the rule of law. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this today. When I review today's agenda, I'm excited that you're gonna get a little glimpse into the world that I walked into in February of 2017. Because I can tell you that the role of the Office of Attorneys General has been transformed over the last 20 plus years. Part of that is the expansion of the standing doctrine and the cases that we have an opportunity to handle. But I would say that more importantly, for people like me, it is related to the highly qualified lawyers that we now have an opportunity to recruit. I'm excited today you're gonna to be able to see Lawyers like my chief counsel, Catherine Robertson, or my solicitor general, Eddie LaCour. And I'd like to tell you that I can look at them and know that they've come to work at the attorney general's office because they want to work with me. The reality is that's not the case. It's passionate lawyers that that's the only place that they have an opportunity to work on the cases that we get to handle. And so thrilled for you not only to be able to hear from them on the next panel, but to be able to see similarly situated lawyers around the country still in AG's offices or who have graduated from that to go onto the federal bench or to be able to have significant litigation practices in their own right. Now, my goal this morning in my limited time with you is to not solve a problem, but to share with you one that I deal with daily. An issue that is not new to me or unique to our office, but famously discussed by a legal scholar that many of you in this room know, appreciate, respect, and now miss. Three weeks ago, our country lost an important conservative voice in the death of Judge James Buckley, who passed away at the age of 100. Judge Buckley served as the United States Senator for New York. President Reagan appointed him to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And though best known most to, to most of us as law students, as the named appellate in the case of Buckley versus Vallejo. It was Judge Buckley's musings later in life that have had a significant impact on me as Alabama's Attorney General. The ripe age of 91, Judge Buckley published a little book entitled Saving Congress from Itself, Emancipating the States and Empowering the People. In that 102 pages, Judge Buckley gave a call to arms for Congress to stop and for the states to resist the bribery of states in the form of massive federal grants, a phenomenon that Buckley argued undermines a state's responsibility to its own citizens and ultimately our constitutional structure. I submit to you that that book has never received the fanfare that it deserved, and I remain convinced that it contains perhaps the most important message for our state to hear today. As this group well knows, the framers of our Constitution designed a system of government to have two major checks on absolute power. One, the separation of powers amongst our three branches in the federal government. And number two, and most importantly, federalism, leaving numerous and indefinite powers with the states 
and only a few defined powers to Washington. Buckley correctly noted that the federal grants programs affect virtually every aspect of state government, transforming states into mere administrators of programs designed by politically unaccountable agencies in Washington. In doing so, he wrote, the state citizens are stripped of the ability to decide how the services and projects that have the most impact on their lives are to be designed and administered. And y'all having seen now firsthand for the last six plus years the underbelly of state government, I can tell you that Buckley was right, that we have in too many respects sold Alabama's sovereignty. So how'd we get there? To answer that question, Judge Buckley pointed to another old law school case, Stewart, versus, Stewart Machine versus Davis. that originated right here in Birmingham, Alabama in the late 1930s. The plaintiff, Stewart Machine, was and still is an Alabama corporation. They were challenging Title IX of the Social Security Act. That act imposed a federal payroll tax on employers, payable to the United States Treasury, and then provided a tax credit back to the employers whose money was paid into a qualifying federally approved state unemployment compensation fund paid for with those state tax dollars. The idea behind that tax provision was to encourage, and I use that word specifically, states to establish programs of unemployment insurance without fear of placing their employers at a competitive disadvantage to other states. If the state adopted unemployment compensation laws that were agreeable to the federal government, then the employers would get a 90% tax credit. If not, the feds would keep 100%. Interestingly, the scheme was said to have been the brainchild of Justice Brandeis who you may remember famously declared the states to be the laboratories of democracy only a few years before. Yet, like any good progressive, Brandeis had clearly evolved beyond that Neanderthal thinking. The case eventually reaches the United States Supreme Court, which examined whether or not the tax under the Social Security Act was constitutional. As you remember or can probably guess, the court did not find a Tenth Amendment violation. A particular interest to me as it relates to the majority was this observation from Justice Cordoza. He wrote, the state of Alabama did not offer a suggestion that in passing the unemployment law, she was affected by duress. For all it appears, she is satisfied with her choice and would be sorely disappointed if it were now to be annulled. Well, the four horsemen, those justices who oppose FDR's uh, New Deal, had a vigorous dissent. And they wrote, if we are to survive as the United States, the balance between the powers of the nation and those of the states must be maintained. Apparently until now, the states remain free to exercise governmental powers not delegated or prohibited without interference by the federal government through threats of punitive measures or offers of seductive favors. Unfortunately, the decision just announced opens the way for the practical annihilation of this theory. And no cloud of words or ostentatious parade of relevant statistics should be permitted to obscure that fact. 77 years after the four horsemen sounded that alarm, Buckley sat down to pen his book. And I can only imagine him seemingly fuming over Congress just having passed the Affordable Care Act when he wrote that that body had far too long, in his words, dabbled in areas for which it's forbidden to act by bribing the states to adopt Congress's approaches to problems that are the state's exclusive responsibility. In the 2012 decision of NFIB versus Sibelius, the states argued that the federal requirement to expand Medicaid under the ACA or risk all federal Medicaid funding was surely coercive. In Alabama, for example, 70% of our Medicaid budget comes from the federal government. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority, explained that the court had never been compelled to establish the line in which pers persuasion gives way to coercion. But whatever that line may be, the ACA was purely, surely beyond it. Still, the court reaffirmed its belief. In the typical case, states can still say no. You'll recall the chief's infamous line, the states are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they need to act like it. Nevertheless, Obama persisted, and the states, for the most part, quietly obliged. You may remember the first time that we heard about a bathrooms controversy was in 2016, when that administration, via the Department of Justice and Department of Education, 
sent out a memo that purported to mandate public schools throughout the country to allow students to use the bathroom or locker rooms of the, agenda, of the gender for which they identify. States were threatened with their education funding and 13 states, including Alabama, sued and secured an injunction against that policy. And for the next four years during the Trump administration, states were able to breathe a sigh of relief. But I can only imagine that in January of 2021, that Joe Biden mumbled, mumbled to someone somewhere, hold my beer, because it was on. Consider, for example, the provision in the American Rescue Plan of 2021 that purported to prohibit states from directly or indirectly lowering taxes for three years after accepting COVID relief funding. Each state was instructed to certify that it can comply with the mandate lest it face federal enforcement action. Joined by 12 other states, Alabama sued and successfully blocked this provision of the act from being enforced. Then came the vaccine mandates, where entire departments of our state government were threatened with large portions of their budget if every employee wasn't vaccinated against COVID as early and as often as this administration saw fit. And while we were successful in three of our four challenges, I remain troubled that the CMS mandate that was upheld that in my opinion, was the most offensive from an anti-commandeering standpoint. Today, we're fighting endless gender mandates from the United States Department of Education, the United States Department of Justice, and even the United States Department of Agriculture that could affect every girl's sports team and locker room in this state while threatening funding streams that our state has become hopelessly dependent upon. Now, whatever you may think about vaccines or girls' sports, in these cases, the federal government simply doesn't want to hear what Alabama has to say. Yet as a state, we continue to put ourselves in a position of vulnerability because we have sold our sovereignty. Nine years ago, Buckley declared the incompetence at the IRS, the VA, and the CDC had undermined the myth that Washington necessarily knows best. He believed that once Americans recognized the true cost of these programs, they would know that they had everything to gain from their termination, both as citizens as well as taxpayers. Sadly, we failed to examine that true cost back in 2014, and I have to believe that Buckley struggled to believe the increasing pervasion of the CDC and the IRS, as well as other federal agencies that would soon follow. Now, for most of you, what I've described is simply part of news reports or blog posts that you may see, and they're not germane to your daily practice. But yet, you work and you live in this state. And what I've described for you is how we govern. Hopefully my remarks today are like that young boy selling Republican puppies, because the tension I've described isn't going away. The question, maybe better characterized as a challenge, is what is Alabama gonna do about it? Fortunately, there is a silver lining. We're quite blessed, thanks in part to the work of the Federal Society, that we have federal judges across our country including those at the highest levels who love our Constitution in the same way that Judge Buckley did, and understand the urgency with which we must restore federalism in this country. The courts, however, need a willing partner in this endeavor, either in Congress or the states. I believe, as Judge Buckley did, that the states are the answer. That's why I'm so passionate about preserving Alabama's sovereignty and why I take great pleasure in working with like-minded states on these issues. As you'll see from our next panel, there are also many dedicated conservative lawyers working in AG's offices across the country who believe this too, and come to work every day determined to get our country back on track and structured the way our framers intended it to be. I'm so thrilled to see the numbers that are here today and the fact that our Alabama chapter is thriving. So grateful that you allow me to be here this morning and sharing a little bit of my life with you that we deal with on a daily basis. Thank you very much.